morning. This is the day the Lord has made. You're getting it. Let's try it one more time. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It truly is a day of rejoicing because we get together as free people and worship the risen Lord together. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to everyone who is a mother. Happy Mother's Day to everyone who had a mother. Happy Mother's Day to anyone that's ever birthed an idea. Happy Mother's Day to everybody today. Um, it's a good day to remember where we came from and to give gratitude. Um, so, And also to miss our mothers as well. I know I was only in my 30s when my mother died, and so it's been a long time, but um, I miss her every day. We're so glad to have you here. For those of you that might be visiting, welcome, welcome, welcome. Make yourself at home. For those of you that are members or have been coming here for a while, but maybe you haven't been here in a while, welcome home. And for those of you that were here last week, welcome home. We're so glad to have you. My name is Jane Pettit, and I am the interim pastor for Community Press for this season of transition as you continue to restore your campus and renew your vision for our being church in the community. So we've got so much to be grateful for and to celebrate today. Um, do we have any announcements from anyone? Anything that we need to talk about before we get started? Okay, just a reminder, um, we are following the Presbyterian Worship of Order. You're going to get very familiar with this. It'll have different liturgy, but it'll be basically in the same order. And our sermon text will be following what's called the Revised Common Lectionary. It is a group of texts that lead us through the church year. And it is a group of texts that we share with um, many other faith traditions. So if someone is visiting from out of town and your church goes by the lectionary, you'll find this a very familiar and comforting uh, series of texts as well. So it's such a privilege that we get to be here and worship together. So let's prepare our hearts to do so. Sing to our God a new song. 
God has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the world open and its people sing together for joy. Let's bow your heads for the opening prayer. Loving God, help us to love others as Christ has loved us. Bring us into the spiritual joy of living our lives as your friend and teach us to abide in your love that we may show that love to the world. Amen. Okay, let's sing the uh, hymn of praise, praise to the Lord the Almighty with the bulletin insert. be seated. God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. It is new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. Knowing that we will find mercy in the presence of our God, we have the courage to confess our sins before God and one another. Will you join me in the prayer of confession? Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. Indeed, because we have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have failed to be a people fully obedient to these commands. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. Gracious God, Command what you will, and give what you command. Give us the love that you require of us. Fill our whole heart with love for you that becomes a wholehearted love for our neighbor. Amen. The scripture announces that this is a true saying, and it is to be universally accepted. Christ came into the world to save sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, in Christ we are forgiven. The peace of Christ be with you.
Please stand for the glory of Patri. be seated. Come Holy Spirit, that through your word we may be guided into the love of God for all the world. Amen. verses 44 through 48. Listen for the word of God. While Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. The second reading is from 1 John 5, verses 1 through 6. Listen for the word of God. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome, for everyone (coughs) born of God overcomes the word. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth.
Ginger, would you come forward? <laughs> and um, are you, you're vaccinated, right? I'm vaccinated. Would you mind coming up? No, just come up here and we'll make sure we stand six feet apart. And I'd like to ask any session members that are here um, on the current session, if y'all would come forward and stand right down here. We're having to adjust a little bit um, because of the protocols still in place, but normally this would be a real love fest moment. But um, Ginger is going to become a new member today. And we're so excited to have her. As you can see, she's already a beloved part of the community, and we appreciate so much um, you sharing your gifts with us and your time and, and your heart. And so, uh, Ginger is coming for, uh, by transfer of letter from the Methodist Church, and where, where are you? Kingwood, Texas. Okay. So um, since she came from another Christian tradition, there's no examination. Normally when someone comes in for membership, if it's by profession of faith, they would have um, just a conversation with the session just to talk about any questions that they might have about the Presbyterian tradition and, and just sort of as a way to get to know each other and also a kind of a formal welcome in to the church. But today we just uh, welcome her in by transfer of membership. And I'm just going to ask you just a couple of questions. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And will you do everything you can in your power to support uh, Christ's ministry through this church? Yes, I will. Okay. Well, then um, let me pray for you. Gracious God, um, we give you praise and thanksgiving for this day and for this opportunity to celebrate um, Ginger as a new member of Community Presbyterian Church. Lord, we thank you that she is willing to share her gifts and her heart and her time and her faith with us. May your blessings be upon her as she continues to discern your vision and walk in your way. And may we as a congregation support her in that ministry as well. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Now normally this would be a time where all the session members would hug you and I would hug you and we would do that. So we'll have some air hugs, but let's, um, session, let's give a big welcome for her and everyone. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, now you may be seated. You're off the hook now for, for a minute. Okay. Apologize for bringing a drink in the sanctuary, but I don't know. Are y'all having allergies this season with all this wind? I got a little um, hot liquid in here, so my throat won't go out on me completely. Seems to be more the case the older I get. Okay, our gospel reading this morning, and also I want to thank Marilyn for um, being the lay leader today. I really appreciate for her modeling and leading off, and this is what we want to have every week, at least one lay leader. And you don't have to, you don't have to memorize anything. We have everything printed for you, and, um, and if you want to just do one of the readings and you don't even want to sit up here for any time at all, you can sit in your pew and come up if you would like to. So really, I'm hoping that you will... Um, Call the office and let them know that you'd be willing, let Dee Dee know that you'd be willing to do that. If you don't volunteer, remember Betty and I will be recruiting you. So, we're going to get you anyway. Okay, the gospel reading this morning, we're uh, picking up where we left off last week. John 15, verses 9 through 17, as we continue to hear God's grace through God's word. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you, do not, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants, some translations are slaves, any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. 
You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and to bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the strong witness of the word of the God. I know it kind of seems like a long time ago, but do you remember when people used to go to sporting events in big crowds at football stadiums? How many of you have been to um, the Cowboy Stadium in Dallas? How many of you have seen a Cowboy game? Or maybe a Houston Texas game, Houston Texan game? Well, you know that if you go to one of these games, any professional sports, but it seems like especially for football, and maybe even particularly especially for Cowboy and Texan games, that when you, even when you're walking into the stadium, you start to get the feeling that you are stepping into a particular story. And it's a strong story about winners. And when you walk in, there's the logo of the team everywhere. There's music playing. There's all kinds of merchandise that you can buy that has the logo on it. They sell the drinks and the cups that have the logo on it. And when you walk in, there's just this huge amount of energy in the stadium that is about the story of the Cowboys, our boys, who are winners. And then there's the cheerleaders that are dancing and the music that's going on, and you just get caught up. It's, it'd be hard for anybody not to get caught up in the energy of these events. And it's all about telling the story about our boys. And then when the game starts, they've got those big jumbotron, and they've got the music going, and they see, show pictures of the boys coming out to play. And then when the game starts, any time that the Cowboys get a down or when they get a touchdown, then the whole place just erupts in celebration. And they replay it over and over and over again. So in case we had forgotten, our boys are doing well. Now... If the other team, if the other team scores a touchdown, you'll notice that the noise level is like that. And up on the jumbotron, they are usually replaying some fantastic move that the Cowboys did a couple of downs ago. But you will not see on replay, except if you're home in your TV living room, you'll see the replay of both. But you will not see a replay of the opposing team having a touchdown. Why? Because that doesn't go with the story because that doesn't talk about how our boys are winners. But everything about this event is trying to get us focused on the story that is uniting us around this team of winners. That is the power of story. And they say the people who study these things and are a lot smarter than me have come out with this theory that the reason that Homo sapiens were able to survive and thrive where Neanderthals, although sometimes I have been called a Neanderthal with certain things I've thought about, but the reason that the Neanderthals didn't thrive and survive in the same way that the Homo sapiens did is because the Homo sapiens held a capacity for story. Now, in the very beginning, when it's just about survival, a couple of people can work together to survive. And even up to maybe a hundred people, you could gather them around just the sheer act of surviving, getting food, getting shelter. But if you get much larger than that, you need some kind of story that binds them. And if you look through this prism, you'll see in all aspects of history and location, Everything revolves around a particular story. This was the case in the day that the Gospel of John was written and the Gospel of John would have been heard and in the days that Jesus walked the land. And the story at the time was the story of Caesar, the story of empire. And everything revolved around the empire being the winners and Caesar being the best and lifted up as Lord over all. Caesar Augustus was even called the Son of God because they considered his adopted father as supreme and divine. This is the story 
that Jesus breaks into. And what Jesus does, he breaks in with a new story. You see, the story of Caesar is all about empire, all about winning, and very little about the common person or the common people. Also in this time, as I think I've said at least one, one or two weeks before, is that the individual thinking that we have now, you know, the, the have it your own way Burger King mentality would have been unheard of for them. It was all about the collective body moving into one story or another. You were considered a people, and the only way you understood yourself was who you were within your people. And so the people, the Israelites, were nothing in the story of empire. They were oppressed. They were just trying to be able to continue to serve God and to worship God. And they were trying to keep the status quo. So then Jesus comes in with this new story. This story about not a God of power and vengeance, but a story about a God who pours God's self out in love. A story that was embodied in the person of Jesus, who then told his followers, because he knew that they would need something, something to hold on to when his physical presence was no longer with them. They would need something to keep from scattering. Because what do we do when our leader is not there? In fear, if we feel threatened, we'll scatter from one another, right? Who, how are they going to stay together? And so Jesus tells them this, we're friends. I'm here for you. I'm going to lay down my life for you. That's what a friend does. The other thing about that period was that the notion of love was not some sentimental emotion. They would have only understood love meant action. Worship meant service. Love meant action. So Jesus is saying to them, I love you and I am moved for your betterment, your welfare, and I'm going to lay down my life for you, and this is what I expect of you. If you love God, if you love me, you've got to love one another. Remember that word, abide? You've got to remain with one another. That's got to be your story. Now, this story was an anti-story to the story of the day. And the community that John is writing to was an anti-society in the midst of this oppressive empire. Now the temple had already been destroyed, Jerusalem destroyed, so they were without any of their usual bearings and comforts and tangible sights of what was grounding them. And so he was telling them, this is how you're going to survive if you love one another the way Jesus loved us. It is a love that causes you to think of the benefit of the greater good. Now we can come to church every Sunday. We can come to a building every Sunday. We can read our Bible every single day. We can use the word God, God, Jesus, Jesus over and over and over so that there's no mistaking to anybody where our loyalties are. But if we are not moved to love our neighbor through our actions and service, then we are not following Christ. And people who do not follow the actions of Christ are actually the antichrist. And you may have heard that word antichrist as being this big bad demon at the end of all things, and that's in Revelation, which one day we'll talk about that. But for now, I would ask you just to set that aside because that's... It's not a good interpretation anyway. But um, to be antichrist is to live in a way that goes against what Jesus commanded us. Another little tidbit for you might, maybe to keep in mind in that time was that this whole talk about you're not slaves, you're my friends. Well, at that time, um, friendships were a little bit different in that environment, as you could imagine, and you ha might have what is called a political friend. And that would have been that someone in power would do something for you, like allow you to live, and then in turn, you would do everything you can to uphold their reputation. Remember back on the Jumbotron when we never showed anything that was negative towards the boys? The, the political friend would never say anything, even if the ruler 
the person in power made a mistake or committed a sin or did something wrong, they would never. It was blind loyalty. Again, that is not the kind of thing that Christ calls us to, especially in the church. If you've ever worked or served in a church for longer than 30 minutes, you know there's a lot of things that go wrong in relationships in the church, right? I mean, we're humans, and so we have that capacity for good and that capacity for evil. I really truly believe that there's no such thing as a good person or a bad person. We're all just people capable of doing good and evil. But in the power of Christ, we are led in the way that leads us to more the good. And if love is the compass, if love is the measure, if love is the ruling guide for our discernment, then we'll be led closer to follow in Jesus. I went on this mission trip years ago. I was uh, the only old person with a bunch of young people, and they were doing uh, street ministry by singing. They had a band, and so they would go on these street, street corners in Budapest, Hungary, and provide these concerts, and they played you know, modern music and stuff, and so we would get these crowds of people to come, and we would have conversations with them. And um, I remember I didn't have any idea why I was there. I just felt like such a fish out of water, as I've shared with you before, and you may have heard today, Marilyn can, Marilyn can attest to, I can't sing. Um, no matter how much I try, I can't carry a tune. So I just would sit on a park bench when they were all doing their magic with music and sit there. And I remember praying, well, you know, if you want me to talk to somebody, I, somebody's going to have to appear next to me because I'm just not going to go up and try to impose myself on someone. And isn't it funny how God just laughs at you when you put an ultimatum like that? The next thing you know, I had this young man sitting beside me, and he looked like a young Bob Dylan, that pasty face and the wild eyes and the hair, and, um, and he just started talking to me. And he started cussing at me. In fact, I didn't realize that you could say um, one of those words so many times in a sentence and there actually still be a message. I was having to listen really close <laughs> to hear if he was saying hello in between cussing me out. And I guess because I didn't get up and run away, he finally calmed down a little bit. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, we're just out here making music and talking. And he said, you Christians. And when he said it, it sounded worse than the word he was using previously, just the way it snarled off of his mouth. And I, I looked at him and he said, we don't need you here with your pretty words and your little songs and your little trite remarks to us. We're in pain here. We have a lot of problems. We need a lot of help. And we don't need you over here trying to convert us. So I was puzzled by that, and really there was nothing to say, because that's exactly what we were doing. We were over there with our pretty little music and had our pretty little songs, and we're going to talk about it that night, like how many people we got to pray for and all that. All that came out, I could hear myself say, well, we're not here to try to convert you. And... Um, we're just here to show you the love of Christ. And he said, oh, I don't, know, you know, I don't know anything about that. And he pointed over to this huge cathedral that was just beautiful over in the distant vision. And he said, I will never go in that. That's what being Christian is, and I will never go in that cathedral again. They're full of lies. And I didn't even know what to say to that person, so I didn't say much else. You know, we kind of parted company. We had... He, uh, he actually did let me pray for him, but I'm sure he was just be tolerating me, actually. But a couple of days later, we had some free time, and I went to the Holocaust Museum that is set in Budapest. And it was told from the story, it's told the story of the Holocaust from the viewpoint of the Hungarian Jews. And what I learned is that by the time that the Nazis got to Budapest, that the evil, the evil was so ramped up that there were more Hungarian Jews killed in a shorter amount of time than in the entire Nazi period. It, had just, it was just at a fever pitch. And the place where we were staying was actually in what had been the Jewish ghetto. 
they had taken people that were having productive lives and had a, different houses and apartments and stuff, and they had herded them all into this ghetto. And they'd taken over their jobs, their businesses, and then from that point, it just got worse. And then they would put them on buses and send them to camps. I was devastated as I walked through, and when I learned that much of it was done right in the midst of Christianity being practiced in that area, and much of it with the complicity of the church. Now, the church wasn't trying to be evil. They were trying to stay open. They were trying to do business as usual. But what they did was that they helped this evil process along. I've never quite been the same about the church since then. I've had this gnawing thing that we need to always be checking ourselves. We say we're Christian, but are we loving Christ by loving our neighbor? If you want to worship God, then you figure out what God cares about. And scripture very clearly tells us through the words of Jesus, then you love your neighbor. You hear so much in the church about why people aren't coming to church anymore, why are churches declining. I think it's a perfect opportunity for us to ask ourselves, what are we missing? Not what's wrong with them, but what are we missing? What do we need to be listening to? Are we in the vision of loving our neighbor? You know, there is no difference between the secular and the spiritual when it came to Jesus the Christ. Where did he do his ministry? Out. <laughs> Out with the people. What did he say was important? Feed the hungry. Give the thirsty something to drink. Give someone who needs shelter a place to lay their head. If somebody's sick, comfort them. Be with them. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel, is that by the power of Christ, we're never alone in any one situation. And that we are called as a body in loving one another to be able to love the community. I don't know you yet. <laughs> and I may not be with you long enough to get to know you really well because the whole idea is to get you ready for that one pastor who will. But the little bit that I've seen, I see that you are a welcoming community. And I see that your work through the helping hands and other things that each one of you are involved in in the community, I want to encourage you that whether you're doing it as an official, official project of the church, you are being church. That's what we come here on Sundays to be nourished and fed and get ready. It's kind of like your weekly pit stop. <laughs> You come in here, you get fed, and then you go out there and you be the church. And in doing that, in remembering that, and in being patient with one another, and loving one another, and allowing ourselves to be filled up together, that the work out there, it's going to bring us closer to the prayer of Jesus when he said, may it be on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We are convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. A, a quick
quick prayer request. It's not meant to be making light, but I'm sure you've noticed <laughs> through the bulletin that there is spaces between some words, and it's not quite as um, perfect of a document that I wish it was. This is on me. Um, Dee Dee and I are working together on the bulletin, and our computers uh, speak different languages. <laughs> and so what I'm sending is not being translated. And um, I, I sent her the bulletin to print the other day. And, and then what she got was this wild kaleidoscope looking thing. And so um, keep us in your prayers this week. We are going to figure this out. And we're going to uh, get, it, get it better. But anyway, I just wanted to point out that we do know that there's some, some mishaps on this week. And it's on me. Do we have any other prayer requests that you want to speak before we go to God in prayer? Yes. Um, a, a very good friend of mine got me off the street and passed away yesterday. And uh, I just request prayers for his friends and uh, his son, who uh, had the great joy of just having a baby this week. But uh, Malcolm would never get cut off. So prayers for Malcolm Murdoch and uh, all his family. It's, it's just amazing how life happens in the highest moments and the lowest moments all at the same time. And um, that is a perfect example of Christ being with. So thank you for that. Anything else? Okay. Um, I'm going to leave some space, in, uh, a time of silence. And if you have something you'd like to lift up, um, if not, it'll just give us space for God to hear our hearts. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, in Jesus the Christ, you taught us to pray and to offer our petitions to you in his name. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers for others may serve your will and show your steadfast love. God of love. God, our creator, you made all things in your wisdom and in your love you save us. We pray for the whole creation. Write what is wrong. Feed and satisfy those who thirst for justice, so that all your children may freely enjoy the earth you have made, and joyfully sing your praises. God of love, gracious God, you have called us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Keep us one in faith and service, breaking bread together and proclaiming the good news to the world, that all may believe you are love, turn to your ways, and live in the light of your truth. God of love. O oh God, whom we cannot love unless we love our neighbors, remove hate and prejudice from us and from all people so that your children may be reconciled with those we fear, resent, or threaten and live together in your peace. God of love. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world. Look with compassion on those who are sick. Cheer them by your word and bring healing as a sign of your grace. God of love. Lord, hear the prayers of your people's heart. Lord, I thank you for this congregation and this church that you called into being so long ago and who's, who is held in your steadfast love even today. I pray for your blessings on your congregation, that as they move towards restoration and renewal, you will guide them each step of the way. I pray that you will bless them with a patience and a trust in you, and may their joy be deepened as they grow in this trust. Mighty God, whose word we trust, whose spirit enables us to pray, accept our request, and further those which will bring about your purpose for the earth. Through Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I said last week, that um, as we move forward and lift some of the restrictions, at some point we will have an offertory 
moment of music while when we have ushers that will actually take up the offering once again. Remember when that used to happen a long time ago? But for now, we have an offering box right by the door, and so I want to pause and, and tell you how much uh, your gifts and offerings are appreciated, and we ask that you would continue to remember that as a part of your worship practice. And now, would you stand, please? If you're, And I want to say one thing about the standing, because uh, some days my knees just don't want to stand. <laughs> and so when we said the little, when we had that little asterisk, it's saying that uh, it's an invitation to stand. But please, if you don't feel like standing, if it hurts your joints, or you just don't feel like it today, that's okay. Don't ever feel obligated to stand. Just know that that is an invitation. So now, although you are going to have to stand to get out of here, so you might want to stand for the sending hymn, and then after the benediction, you may leave. Please leave directly through the doors right after the service and gather outside. Please don't bundle up there at the door or in the pews. If you'll just be patient with us for a little bit longer, and then um, we'll get back to normal, whatever that is, one of these days. Let's sing the sending hymn. can't sing, but I could kind of dance with it, so I thought that was great. Okay, remember, we're going to move on out at, right after the benediction, and I'm, I will go out there also. I'd love for to visit with you out there. If you just give me a couple of minutes to get out there, that would be great. And as you leave this place, I pray that you leave knowing that you have been wonderfully and fearfully made by the Creator God, and that in Jesus the Christ, you have been lovingly redeemed. And you leave here, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to live and to love your neighbor. And in loving your neighbor, you'll be loving God. God bless you and go in peace. Bye.